much uh, for that kind introduction. I think the title slide has been on long enough for you to appreciate what this talk is going to be about. But um, um, for the scientists, what is the valve? And somewhat confusing in the literature, they talk about the anatomy of the external and the internal valve. But really, it's a continuum. So the external valve, or the most anterior aspect of the valve, is classically described by the advent of the lower lateral cartilage, the nostril floor, and the membranous septum. And then going further back, the posterior limits of the valve, sometimes described as the internal valve, is the septum, the upper lateral cartilage, and particularly the anterior border of the inferior turbinate. But it's one structure, which is the anterior aspect of the nose. Valve collapse is important clinically. There are changes in the structure of the cartilage and the soft tissues with age. There are also muscles that insert into the anterior aspect of the nasal tip. So people can complain of nasal obstruction due to collapse in this particular area of the nose. This is a simple diagram in sagittal view of the nose. And uh, one, two, and three define pressures of ambience at the, uh, the pressure drop after the valve region and also within the nasal pharynx. Now, as we can see, the nose is not a straight pipe. In fact, air flow travels through two right angles to actually get into the nasal pharynx, and it's got very, very complex uh, geometry. Um, for the purpose of the talk, delta P1 to 2 describes pressure drop across the valve. Uh, delta P23 describes pressure drop across the nasal vault, which is this area here. And delta P1 to 3 is the transnasal pressure drop. Now, Nasal models are nothing new. There have been techniques in nasal modelling that have been around for over 100 years, from simple mathematical equations in 1915 to basically defining flow across a rigid structure, the valve, using the hagen poiseuil um, formula. But as I alluded to earlier, uh, flow through the nose is anything comparable to flow in a steady state through a straight pipe. So I did some work with Graham um, in 30 years ago now, crikey, um, uh, where we looked at flow through the valve and we added uh, a formula that would calculate the area but also specifically the, the stiffness of the nasal valve, uh, nasal valve, but there was no volt equation. This talk is going to take that sort of uh, study a little bit further where it includes a volt equation and also it's looking at flow in an unsteady situation, not a steady state, which is what the work described in 1988. So um, we'll be uh, describing flow limitation reduction, but we'll also be correlating rhinomanometry to acoustic rhinometry and uh, defining why there are dichotomies in the findings between the two from a clinical perspective. And we'll also finish up on talking about inspiratory loops, which Graham is going to talk about. I know it's post-lunch, but if the clinicians could just bear with me a little bit. So we've got the, the nasal valve region here, uh, which is uh, defined by pressure drop delta uh, 1 to 2. The area of outflow, uh, A0 and A2, the area with flow. And these are functions that calculate the stiffness and also the flow coefficient, which is a measure of the actual over the ideal uh, flow across that valve area. And then we've got, over the nasal vault, we've got a pressure drop 2 to 3, area of the uh, vault, and then the loss coefficient, which is KL. And this equation here uh, basically uh, defines flow across a rigid valve, and this equation on the right defines flow across the nasal vault. And this equation has an additional equation that makes allowance for the valve stiffness, which I described to earlier. So normal values have been well described in the literature, and the ones that I want you to commit to memory, because it's important uh, as the talk goes on, is the average uh, nasal valve area, which has a range of 50 to 70 uh, square millimetres. Uh, the nasal vault has a range of 117 to 190, and an average area of 144. Um, nasal resistance depends on what pressure you measure uh, flow. But by convention, in anterior rhinomanometry, we measure resistance at 150 pascals, which is approximately 0.25 pascals uh, per cubic centimetres per minute. And then the pressure drop across the nasal valve itself 
we can see that um, approximately 55% of the total pressure drop occurs at the valve region. Uh, and the effects of decongestion also on the valve, the valve area increases by 19%, but it also has a big effect on the volts, 74%, and the importance of that we'll come back to later. I just want you to focus on the graph for the time being. This is a graph showing flow rate against transnasal pressure, and the coloured markers are um, points that have been defined experimentally. So we've got work of uh, Philip Cole here in 1989, and uh, John Palanche in the Mayo, and we've got some uh, that define flow and pressure in the congested nostril and others in the decongested state. And the dotted lines, as you can see, these are simulated models um, that show the closeness of fit in a decongested simulation and a congested stimulation. And I just want you to note uh, the quotient there of 0.64 rather than 0.5 and we're going to come back to that, that later. So these are important uh, features where we've changed the modelling to reflect the, the Reynolds number and the effect that has on the coefficient of discharge and that's going to be explained by Graham in more detail later. On the left here we've got the flow rate across a rigid valve, on the right flow rate across the nasal vault and we can combine these two equations to give uh, a delta 1 to 2, the cross, the loss over the valve compared to the total transnasal uh, uh, loss. And nasal resistance, again defined at resistance at a pressure of 150, um, that can be defined by the combined resistance of this equation and that equation, this equation being the resistance at the valve and this the resistance over the vault. So this is a graph which shows the contribution of the valve and the vault to total unilateral nasal resistance. So we've got the resistance uh, on the ordinate axis, we've got the flow area here, and uh, can I just uh, rekindle your memory that the in a normal state the average valve area is here between 50 and 70. And what this shows, uh, allowing that this is uh, uh, measurements where the vault area is 144 square millimetres, that when the valve area is very very small and less than 35 almost all the contribution to the unilateral nasal resistance is at the valve. But in the normal situation where the cross-sectional area is between 50 and 70, you can see that both the <coughs> valve and the vault itself have an equal contribution to the total uh, uh, resistance. So, oh, I keep on losing my... So if you add that, okay, the blue line, the vault, the red, the valve, they have a 50% roughly contribution to the total resistance at that cross-sectional area between 50 and 70. What happens when you change the area of the vault? So uh, these are areas of 101, 144, which was shown in the previous slide, and 187 square millimetres. Uh, and again, you can see um, that in the normal valve areas between 50 and 70, um, you see that the vault uh, does have uh, a significant role to, to play um, in the, the total uh, resistance, but whereas if you get smaller valve areas, it's more a function of, of the valve. So I'd like to introduce Graham now to come and do the, the second part of the talk. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Okay, if you have a look on the right here, we have um, pressure against flow. Uh, the red are experimental results. Uh, it shows two simulations. The first one is for uh, constant flow coefficients. Uh, that's the black dotted line. Uh, the other one is where the flow coefficients are a function of Reynolds number. And you can see that's a, a much better fit. Uh, on the left there, upper left, you can see how the flow coefficients vary with the Reynolds number. And the, uh, the valve discharge coefficient uh, is uh, modelled using this modified logistic function shown there on the bottom. Uh, inspiratory loops. Uh, if you look on the right again, these are experimental results and you can see that at high transnasal pressure differences uh, you get this uh, large loop um, uh, uh, that's the difference between the acceleration phase of inspiration and the deceleration phase. Uh, 
Uh, during nasal flaring, that loop is much reduced and the flow rate is much increased. And we've gone on too far. Uh, on the right, it's the same uh, diagram. And our theory uh, relates to differential changes in the flow coefficients between the acceleration and the deceleration phases of inspiration. And uh, these have been uh, modeled here for the small uh, valve area at the top in blue and uh, simulating nasal flaring for the larger valve area at the bottom there in green. So putting the, those simulations into the complete model, we get this result. Experimental results on the right and the simulation on the left. And you can see there's a, a degree of uh, similarity there where the simulation is showing a large inspiratory loop uh, before uh, nasal flaring. And uh, that loop is reduced and the flow is increased um, uh, during nasal flaring. So as a summary, uh, uh, nasal airflow, we believe, is better described by consideration of local losses with appropriate flow coefficients rather than by an analogy with airflow through straight pipes. And regarding uh, acoustic rhinometry, the lack of a strong correlation between this and the results of rhinomanometry is largely due to the additional influence of the nasal vault on the results of the latter. And uh, in uh, inspiratory loops, we believe that uh, these are a result of differential changes in the flow coefficients between the acceleration and deceleration phases of inspiration. Thank you.